not be easy for everyone uh, with the pandemic lockdown and restrictions and everything else. Uh, and I want to thank the and congratulate the organizers for sticking to the original schedule and uh, but running the conference virtually. It's a new experience for a lot of us and I hope this format works for everyone. Um, it's interesting because when I speak at conference, I generally look at the faces of the attendees to look for acknowledgements and uh, nod here and a nod there, shake of a head, you know, question and and you know, the sessions get to be a bit interesting. But when you're doing it virtually, uh, these things aren't going, this, these things are going to be a challenge because I can't see anyone out there. So, but we do adapt and hopefully this thing goes well today. I hope I don't have any technical issues like the network going down or anything in the middle of the, uh, middle of the talk. Um, the topic for today is, uh, I have, the topic for today is uh, evolution of uh, automation in uh, CICD. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to talk about how the process of deployment of production has changed over the years. I say years, but uh, I'm going to look at roughly what's changed in the last uh, 25 plus years since I've been in the IT industry. And um, I'll talk about how we've automated things along the way and the evolution of uh, the process and technology that has contributed to these, these changes itself, uh, affected uh, automation and CICD. Um, my talk is basically broken up into four main parts. I'll, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to, um, uh, to CICD. We'll talk about terminologies and so on, so that as we go through the talk, uh, we are talking the same things, right? Uh, we using the same uh, terminology. I then want to talk about um, how I deployed applications to productions when I first started my career. I started my career as a developer, and we'll talk about how we used to deploy applications back then. And then we'll move on to how we are deploying applications today. I, uh, you know, it's class that I work for Agile Energy. It's, it's, a, it's a big energy company here in Melbourne, Australia. And, um, you know, we do multiple deployments in a day. And we'll talk about how we do about these things. This is the big part of my talk. The majority of my talk is focused around this area. And I want to, uh, I want to focus on the process and technology that's moved along since the 90s. Uh, and uh, the amount of influence all of these things have had on uh, CICD and the automation that kind of like comes with it. Finally, I kind of like want to wrap it up with, uh, uh, you know, the challenges and uh, uh, that we still face today. And uh, I'll leave you up with one uh, resource for further reading that you can actually take with you after the talk and look it up and, and all that kind of stuff. So let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, let's, 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 Let's start with the introduction, of C, introduction to CICD. Now, um, if you look at CICD, I mean, collectively what CICD is, it's, it's a way of releasing applications to, uh, to users by a way of uh, automating the various uh, steps and stages of, of release itself. And uh, it consists of three main things. We talk about continuous integration, we talk about continuous uh, delivery and continuous deployment. And uh, if you look at um, continuous integration, um, this is the process where changes are made by the developer. The developer basically goes and checks in uh, his or her code, and um, and, and then you know the whole uh, the CI thing kicks off. There are three main things to it. There's the build component, there's the testing, and then the reporting component. So with the build component, this is all about the automation of the build process itself. So when a developer checks in the code, we want to make sure that the code that has been checked in hasn't uh, broken the build. So you kind of like compile everything and make sure that the build is still working um, and uh, you know, the code is compiling and everything is fine. But that's not enough. You want to make sure that uh, you're also testing the, the changes that you've made. We want to make sure that as part of the automated testing to ensure that any new changes that you actually introduce does not regress any existing functionality. So if there was a functionality that was working before, if you made some changes, we want to make sure that doesn't break it. And finally, we want to kind of like start reporting on it. Now, CI build systems, um, they monitor these check-ins. And uh, when someone actually makes a change, it kicks off the whole automation process and builds everything else. But what if something actually breaks down? We want to make sure that uh, uh, you know, we start to issue notifications and report on these things to, uh, you know, to people who are actually maintaining it. Continuous delivery, on the other hand, kind of like picks off where uh, continuous integration left off. Now, this is the uh, continuous delivery is all about building artifacts that can be deployed to test our production environments. And of course, again, this kind of has three, three things, right? And uh, the first one is we need to have good continuous integration uh, built into it. 
We want to have uh, continuous testing. We'll talk about continuous testing a little bit um, further down the line. Um, and uh, continuous testing is all about making sure that every time something is actually checked in, we continue to we run the test that we, the automated test that we actually have uh, to make sure there are no regressions, right? And finally, the deployment automation. If you had like a web application, for instance, so you, you want to make sure that you're able to the artifacts, you create those artifacts and so on and so forth, and you're able to deploy them to the websites so people, users can actually start using them. Continuous delivery is, uh, continuous deployment is, uh, is effectively like a software release strategy where um, as soon as a developer commits code, um, the, uh, as, as soon as a, as a, as a developer uh, uh, commits code, we run through the process of you know, creating all the artifacts and so on and so forth and release it all the way into production as quickly as possible. Now, there are a number of gates that it may actually go through. So you may go through testing, you may, you know, you may go through peer review initially uh, to make sure that changes are accepted. And then it may go through uh, all the tests and everything else, and it actually goes all the way to production. Now, organizations have varying levels of maturity when it comes to uh, CI CD itself. Um, a lot of organizations just do continuous integration and continuous uh, delivery, uh, continuous deployment. It's a lot harder to achieve. And there are, um, uh, you know, barriers that organizations put, governance barriers that they put um, up in front of this. So it's much harder to actually get to the continuous uh, deployment. Um, so moving on from here, like I want to quickly talk about, uh, you know, flashback to the 90s, right? This is when I actually started my career. I, like I said earlier, I started my career as a developer. And um, when, we, uh, uh, when we developed code, we used to follow, uh, you know, a waterfall SDLC methodology. So we had a number of processes. We had requirements gathering and we had uh, the design phase. And most of the times, you know, they, they were kind of like combined together. Then we had a development phase and then we had testing and, you know, finally we'd actually release. And so everything took a bit of time. You kind of like went through the first requirements gathering phase first, and then once it's done and you know, the arch architects produce these nice diagrams and so on, we took all of those things and we spent the next six to eight months writing code. Once we actually wrote the code, you know, we passed it on to the, dev to the testers who would actually go and test this application. And when they validated everything was working fine, we would then release it for, uh, basically release it to, to production. But even before that, we went through several steps, right? Uh, we would go through a process where uh, you know everyone's happy; it's all signed off. And uh, on when before we release release it to uh, our users, uh, we would send out a mail saying, "Hey, you know what? Uh, we've got an outage window uh, of uh, you know a couple of hours where you'll not be able to use this application, and um, we're gonna we're gonna upgrade uh, this app, or whatever it is, right? Um, this usually happened on a, on, a, on a Friday evening." because I think we all thought that uh, if something did go wrong dramatically, we had the weekend to actually fix it. And um, this also basically assumed that, you know, we had less number of users over the weekend. You know, the dynamics are actually changed dramatically now. You know, there are probably more users over the weekend uh, for, you know, things like online shopping and so on than there are uh, during work hours. And being a global market, of course, right? I mean, people are, you know, different time zones and, you know, uh, accessing your services all the time. So those things may not work now, but you know, that's what we used to do back then. And so uh, we would all be uh, you know, like the developers, you know, once, once a date has been set, um, you know, me as a, uh, as a developer and a few of us would actually stick around, right? We would create a run sheet, uh, which is basically a basic set of instructions on what to do. Uh, be things like, hey, you know, we need you to uh, back up the database first and we want you to run this database script and you want to run this uh, file. So we kind of like gave a lot of this run sheet to the ops people. Obviously, even then, you know, uh, I think a bit more cowboys, but we still developers weren't uh, um, given access to production. So we had the operations people who would deploy a lot of these things to production. So uh, we would sit with, uh, with the ops people and they would run through these run sheets, you know, step by step. Once it's all done, everything's working fine. You know, we, we do a whole bunch of tests and when everything's working, there's high fives all around. And, um, uh, you know, we can kind of like go home early if everything works fine. If things went wrong, right? Uh, we also wrote a whole bunch of things in our um, run sheets on how, what are the things that you need to do to back out of the change that we've done. Um, Sometimes it may be as simple as, uh, well, I'm going to uh, 
restore things from my backup and I'm going to have it up and running again kind of thing, right? Um, but, you know, this kind of like generated a number of problems for us. Uh, first and foremost, we had this really long development cycles. Uh, dev, you know, we went on for about uh, six to eight months and a lot of times. And um, business users never even got an early glimpse on what this application looked like. I mean, sure, you know, we had screenshots and things like that, but they didn't really see how uh, the application looked like and ran, um, the, you know, uh, how it ran. And um, because of this long cycle, right, we had these infrequent deployments. Uh, one of the measures that we use uh, these days is, is a lead time, right? So how long does it take for someone to check in their code and for it to actually get into production? The lead time of, at that time was really, really large, months in fact. And of course, there are a lot of manual processes involved on the path to production. Yes, you know, we probably did some amount of automation. We um, uh, we wrote some of the scripts and they were automated, but predominantly there are a lot of manual processes. And because of that, you know, it was prone to errors. Someone actually missed a step or did it wrong and, you know, it actually blew up. One other issue that we had was um, inconsistent in environments. Of course, we had dev, uh, test and, you know, staging, production and so on. And um, invariably some of these things got out of sync. Uh, and um, you know, just because we were, you know, the first thing is like a lot of times they were not all the uh, the, the same. Uh, you know, production looked very different to test, and test looked very different to development, and so on. And uh, in terms of hardware configuration, and on top of it, you had other configuration issues such as having the right versions of software and the right patches and, and things like that. So a lot of these things got it gave us a lot of grief back then. Now. If we kind of like fast forward to where we are today, um, like I said, I, you know, I work for, uh, for AGL and we deploy uh, to production um, multiple times, sometimes multiple times a day. There are various teams that um, uh, release software that, that ends up in production. And uh, we have a relatively short lead time. Uh, so if someone actually committed code, it doesn't take, uh, it may not end up on the same day, um, but it uh, but it doesn't take uh, months and months that we used to have before. Um, and uh, we do our deployments, you know, what we call a zero downtime deployment. We don't schedule outages and so on. You know, we uh, at least, you know, uh, of course, you know, we have multiple systems within AGL. Uh, some of the more mature ones, you know, we don't have any uh, any downtime or downtime at all. Uh, we will we'll effectively be releasing things to production during work hours. And um, no one would know that it's actually happening because it's so seamless and it just, just kind of like works. So what has actually happened in these kind of like 20 odd years, right, that's actually contributed and paved the way for um, all this, this stuff that's happening in, in CI, CD and the automation that actually goes ahead with it, uh, that kind of like accompanies it. So I've kind of like listed 10 big areas that have been influential in, in these things. And let's go through uh, through each uh, through uh, through these things one by one. The first one that's actually made a big impact is our ways of working. And um, if you if you if you look at it like what I actually said earlier was that uh, in, um, in in the nineties we were all using uh, uh, like a waterfall kind of approach. Now these days, pretty much a majority of people have moved over to agile methodologies. Well, at least agile has and. Um, with agile methodologies, you know, there's been this introduction of cross-functional teams. So you have teams that have, uh, um, you know, BAs, it's got devs, they've got testers and architects and so on. And we work on uh, small incremental changes. These small incremental changes could be something like a user story or, um, or, uh, or, or a new feature. And these things are ready within a couple of weeks, which is effectively a sprint. So at the end of the sprint, a lot of times these user stories are ready um, for deployment. Whether you deploy it or not is a completely different thing, but these things are functionally complete and they could be deployed into production if you need to. So a lot of these things have now changed um, the way we think. Now, in addition to this, right, there's been strong engineering practices that have, uh, that people have been adopting as part of Agile methodologies. And these things are uh, writing unit tests and automating your acceptance, acceptance tests. And, um, and CI CD form part of these engineering practices. 
Another big contributor to CI, CD and automation in the space is, uh, is the DevOps movement. So what is the DevOps? Well, DevOps is basically nothing but the merger of development operations. Um, so it's not just uh, DevOps is not a team. It's not like we've taken the development team and taken the operations team and put them together, but it is a, it is a culture. Uh, it's a cultural change. It's a mindset change itself. Uh, if you look at the textbook definition of DevOps, it goes something like, you know, it's a set of practices that automates the process between development and operations team to build, test, and release software quickly and reliably, right? Um, effectively, what we are doing is because these two teams are working really closely together, um, you know, automation has become a really key part of it. We are not only interested in, uh, you know, how the developers automate and publish these things to, uh, to production, we're also worried about what happens in production. Uh, you know, if something goes wrong, how is it monitored and how are people notified and how do they actually fix it? Now, uh, DevOps, you know, people may have seen the, you know, the kind of like the, the, the little uh, loop uh, that I've, you know, that's there on the screen over there. Um, so the, I, DevOps itself, you know, consists of, you know, what, what I call and a lot of other people call as the, the inner loop and the outer loop. The inner loop is all about the, the developer's uh, developer experience, right? In this, what the developer would do is they would be plan, they would code, they would uh, build it and they would test it. And then once it's all ready and they've come to the code, the, the outer loop kind of like takes uh, over. Yeah, they, you know, this is all about releasing the software to production. Um, you know, well, once you deploy it, how do you actually uh, operate this application? How do you monitor it? And what happens when things go wrong? And how do you take care of all of these things? Now, this kind of like this, this marriage between developer and, and operation or DevOps, um, you know, kind of like mixes both the, the, the build and run functions. And um, because we are no longer throwing our code across the wall, across the operations people, and then say, hey, anything that actually goes wrong in production is your problem, right? Now it is a joint effort and um, uh, it's a joint effort and kind of like that, we, we want to make sure that we don't get calls at 2 a.m. in the morning uh, because there's a production issue or something like that. So it's kind of like built up that uh, change the culture and the way people, people think. In addition to DevOps itself, we've kind of like uh, started to look towards, uh, towards DevSecOps. And DevSecOps is, um, is kind of like, it's the combination of, of Dev and, and Ops, and DevOps and, and security rather. The, the idea is basically that it's to bring uh, cybersecurity and risk management activities um, uh, into every step of the, the DevOps process. Now, previously what people used to do was, uh, um, security was almost like an afterthought. So you would actually, uh, you know, your application would be ready to be released and then you would have security running things on top and um, uh, fixing things and, and uh, you know, testing it. And then, you know, if there are fixes that need to be done, they would be making all those recommendations and we'd be uh, doing all of that stuff. But now uh, it is, uh, it's part and parcel of the entire operation. And from an automation point of view, you know, kind of like it, it starts to introduce things like uh, static source code scanning and, and, and all those kind of things. You know, we start to think, uh, look for things like SQL injection attacks and everything else during the build process itself and not wait till, till the very end. The next uh, thing that I want to talk about that's got a bit of an influence is version control itself. Now, um, if you, if you look at version control, you know, CI CD practices effectively start from a version control system. Uh, they, version control systems provide two things, right? They, one is they, they provide product, uh, reproducibility and then they provide traceability. So reproducibility as in, you should be able to recreate the entire applica application that actually runs in production, or in some cases, the entire environment, the infrastructure and everything else from your source code itself. We've, uh, and of course, you know, the, 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 the traceable is another important aspect where you can actually compare different versions of change that have been made and then see like, you know, what has been made and who has been made it and who's made it and so on. And in some cases, when you want to kind of like go back to a previous version, you can actually do that as well. Now, the, some of the, the big changes that have actually happened in, in this area is, um, I'll probably list two things, right? One is uh, we've moved over from a central uh, version control system, CVS, to a more distributed version control system uh, like Git. The second big change is that uh, we are now uh, 
checking in into the version control system uh, what the infrastructure look and the configuration should look like. You know, we talk about infrastructure as code and configuration as code, and I'll touch upon this a little bit later. That's all part of the version control system itself. So it's, it makes it really easy for us to actually deploy a brand new environment on demand whenever we need, just from the version control system itself. So there are, there are, just want to quickly touch upon these things. Um, it's a bit of a takeaway uh, on version control system. There are two techniques that people use to, um, you know, well, while they're working with version control system. One is uh, um, Git flow or feature branches that people call it. The other one is trunk based development. Now with feature, uh, with feature branches, you know, every time we are building, working on a new feature, developers make, um, you know, create a new branch and they make the changes on it. And then when they're ready to uh, uh, to uh, release it to production, you know they they, they you know they, they put in a pull request, a pull request is issued, and people uh, you know do a peer review of this, and then they accept those changes, and that eventually moves over to production. In trunk-based development, all the work is done on the main trunk itself, and um, so um, you know if you do create a branch, it is kind of like short-lived. Now research has actually shown that uh, I'm, I'm not basically advocating one or the other, but one takeaway from this is that uh, research has found that trunk-based development does lead to more releases um, as, as well as uh, uh, lesser lead time. So that's something to think about. Now, the, uh, what you actually use, whether it's Gitflow or trunk-based development, depends on a number of things. It depends on the maturity of the organization. It uh, depends on whether you have a lot of junior developers or, or senior developers within the team. Um, it depends on whether you are using open source software or whether it's closed source. And kind of like all these things contribute to uh, what kind of uh, technique that you want to use. Now, one other big change that's actually happened is, um, is the evolution of build tools itself. Now, in the 90s, when I was uh, working, you know, we, the build systems were pretty small. I mean, uh, you know, literally, you know, you had like a make file and that was, that was it. And, uh, you know, you, you compile it from, uh, you know, you either ran your compilers from the command prompt, you ran a make file, and that, that pretty much was it. If you wanted to chain multiple things, uh, you know, you kind of like run a shell script. Um, so in, um, uh, but, but these days, you know, the build systems are uh, fairly uh, uh, complex. And they do a number of things. You know, you can. Uh, it allows you to download. Um, uh, you know, it allows first, first and foremost. You know, as soon as you check in your code, it monitors the version control system and then triggers off the automation that does the CI/CD uh, build. But before that, you know, if there are dependencies that need to be uh, downloaded, you know, these systems are sophisticated enough to go and download those dependencies. They are capable of running a whole bunch of automation tests, and just not automation tests. Uh, they can um, they can also start to look at validating other kinds of things. So if you had uh, if you're looking for if you have tools that can look at uh, the code and uh, measure the code quality and things like that, you can actually do that. Um, and then once it's all done, you know, last but not the least, you know, uh, they can also deploy the application to test or production environments. And of course, you know, along the way, if there's success or failure, they can actually send notifications as well. Now all these tasks, right? They're they're all chained together in, in the in the in, chained together in what we actually call a build pipeline. Now modern tools they allow this pipeline code to be checked into the version control as well. So that's that's one of the one big changes that's actually happened in, in the evolution of build tools. The other big evolution, I suppose, um, it's probably not as big, is move uh, is the move of a lot of these uh, build tools. Uh, to, to being run out of, uh, of, of, of cloud. They run as a, like, more like a software as a service. And, um, uh, and yeah, that's, that's probably the, the other change that's actually happened. So let's talk a little bit about continuous testing. Now, as part of Agile methodologies and so on, I said that um, you know, uh, writing unit tests and, and everything else have become uh, quite popular. It's the way that people work now. But continuous testing is all about the techniques used to ensure that changes that you've made to code uh, do not break whatever you have uh, existing right now. 
Now, um, these, uh, these tests are included and are run as part of the build pipeline continuously. So every time someone actually checks the code and a new uh, um, you know, artifact, is actually, artifact is actually built uh, based on the code, you run a number of automated tests on it to ensure that uh, you, you know, functionally you haven't regressed at all. There are four types of automated tests that uh, people uh, write. The first one is, is the automated unit test. Unit tests basically effectively test a single unit of functionality, whether it's a method, a class, or a function. That's all it actually tests. And it's almost always written by developers. Now, uh, one of the things that uh, people or teams do is they use uh, what is known as TD or test driven development. And this is, a, this is a way of implementing unit tests. In this, what people do is they write the test first before they write the implementation of the functionality in code. So when you first uh, write the test, you know, when you first write TD, it breaks because you haven't written the functionality as well. And then you go ahead and fix the functionality. And, um, and you know, of course, you know, and, and then you get it to work. Um, now, depending on the maturity of the organization and whether uh, there's a lot of um, legacy code and existing code that, that you use, a lot of teams don't use TDDs, and um, for some people, the barrier of entry for TDDs is quite high, and that's okay. I think the more important thing is is not to focus on TDD, but to focus on unit test itself, for uh, you know, for something like CI CD. Let's talk a little bit about automated acceptance tests now. These are tests that typically test uh, of an end-to-end -end functionality or a user story as a, as a whole. So for example, uh, if someone was making a payment, um, you know, you kind of like test the functionality to say that, you know, accepting a credit card uh, actually works. Now, the problem with some of these things is that when you have external interfaces and you're testing some of these things in production, uh, or, you know, uh, or in production code, um, some of these things may not work, right? So you got these external interfaces. So you kind of like you replace some of these external facing interfaces with test double. So you can use things like stubs, um, mocks, which kind of like mock what the, the output of the external function is going to be, or fakes, which literally fake a, a result, right? And, and send it back. In some organizations that I've actually worked in, we use the BDD or behavior driven design, uh, behavior driven development to do automated um, acceptance tests. And these things are uh, very written by business analysts. So this was in the language that BAs understood and they wrote these acceptance tests. And uh, although they're still automated, and uh, although they're still automated, so it actually worked really well. Now, if organizations want to choose to move towards continuous deployment, um, automated acceptance tests are critical in that journey. The next set of acceptance tests that I want to talk about is uh, automated performance tests. These tests basically ensure that functions are working within expected performance thresholds. Um, for example, uh, you know, when you load a page or uh, when, you, when you make a payment or you, know, you create an account and so on, we want to kind of like measure how long it actually takes. And uh, we, we want to make sure that it hasn't regressed. Now, uh, at AGL, we do a lot of synthetic monitoring. So on our website, the public facing website, uh, we, so we kind of like start to measure um, um, how long it, we kind of like imitate an, a user, right? And see how long it actually takes to load a page, um, how long does it take to sign up? And we do all these kind of things. And uh, we do this at runtime. And uh, we check to sh make sure that, uh, um, you, you know, performance hasn't regressed day to day. Now, but there's nothing uh, stopping you to doing exactly picking up whatever you did with the synthetic test and synthetic monitoring um, to uh, include in the build pipeline and um, start to see whether every change that you actually made hasn't had an adverse effect on, uh, on performance. The last one in this is around automated security tests. Now, I did uh, talk briefly about DevSecOps um, as a way of, uh, of working. And uh, automated security is, is, is an important step in moving towards DevSecOps. So what you do is you run a variety of, of security tests all in the build pipeline. So if you want to kind of like do static uh, analysis check or static checking of your code, uh, you can actually do it. 
you know, these things include things like active and passive scanners that help, allow you to pick out uh, things like missing security headers or missing anti-CSRF -CS tokens and so on. So you can actually automate a lot of those things, put it in the build pipeline, and um, kind of like start to find security issues really early. Again, when I talk about um, uh, continuous um, uh, you know, deployment, automating security tests will help you a great deal to actually achieving that. All right, let's talk about uh, deployment techniques. Now, I gave an example of the 90s, right? We would actually have a scheduled outage, two to three hours, and uh, you know, we'd do all the deployment um, on a Friday night. We don't have the luxury of doing that anymore. Like I said earlier, uh, there are users all across the world, different time zones, and uh, you can no longer afford to have a, a scheduled timeout. So, so you want to kind of like, uh, we, you know, AGL is kind of like move towards a zero downtime deployment. And um, so you deploy into production at any given point in time. You don't wait for a certain specific time or, or a date or whatever. So there are three techniques that I want to touch upon today that'll help you along the way in terms of deploying into production without any outage. The first one is uh, blue-green deployment. In blue-green deployment, you have two identical environments. Um, blue and green or you, know, you can call them staging and production and so what you do is you deploy all the changes that you've done to staging environment and uh, then you you run all your tests on it and validate to see if it's working and once it's actually working then you switch it uh, across the production you can actually do uh, uh, you know you swap the two environments you know the switch can happen at the network level like you know maybe you change a uh, dns uh, where it redirects it or whatever it may be but it's done at that level and uh, if a user was, um, was in staging and switched over to production, you know, they wouldn't know any different, right? Maybe they see some new features, um, but there's effectively no outage. Another method people actually use is, uh, is called uh, canary deployment. And um, this kind of like goes back to, uh, uh, to miners, right? So miners, when they actually went over to, to mines and uh, you know, deep down in the ground, uh, they would, they would, they would carry, carry a canary in a, in a cage. And, um, you know, there were some, you know, uh, hazardous gases and, and everything else down there. Uh, carbon monoxide is a silent killer. So they would be working over there and not even know that they're uh, inhaling uh, these gases, right? So uh, when, when you take this bird along and uh, the first sign of distress from this bird, they kind of like realize that, uh, Hey, you know something's actually gone wrong. Maybe we just need to to back out and, and uh, you know head back uh, up, uh, you know get away from the mine, right? And it's kind of like use the same concept or philosophy. Uh, so what we do in this case is we, you, we the deployment is actually done to a uh, to a single server or a subset of servers. And what you do is you using A/B testing techniques, you kind of like uh, route a subset of users to the new server where you actually deployed it. And if something has actually gone dramatically wrong, right, you kind of like back out from that. And then you say, well, I'm not, you know, we can actually see all these alerts and everything else happening. Uh, things aren't working the way they're supposed to work. We're going to back out of this thing. Um, now, if things are okay, then what you do is you start to roll out the change to the other servers as well. And uh, you, you slowly start to uh, move uh, all the users across to, to, the, to, to the new, new deployment. That's how, that's how it works. And again, in this case, you don't have any, uh, any outage. The last uh, uh, technique is, uh, is, is feature flagging. Now, you know, particularly you know, when people do trunk-based development, right? I mean, there are a lot of changes that they, people make and they don't want to necessarily put this, uh, the change that they've done into, into production just as yet, right? So there's a lot of latent code that remains in a deployed application. And the way that they turn these things off is through feature flags. So they have these switches that they can flick off and on. When they switch them off, those features or that code is, is not being used at all. And that's one way of actually ensuring that uh, um, you, know, you, you constantly uh, check in your code. And even if you're not ready to release your feature, it's fine. And so uh, you know, people talk about dark releases or you know, like, uh, 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 you know, just, just releasing these things with, with these feature flags on. And uh, sometimes if, um, if it needs to go through some kind of a, a cab uh, change approval board to actually approve the change, um, they don't have to wait till that 
uh, tick is obtained before they, they release the production. They can actually release the production, and then when, when the cab basically approves of the change, right, they kind of like enable the, the flag and, and, you know, and, and the features available for users to use right away. The other big change that's actually happened over the years is, um, is to infrastructure. Uh, back in the day when, uh, in, in, the, in the 90s, right, where we pretty much installed everything to physical service. And, um, and uh, you know, interestingly enough, you know, all these servers had some kind of a, a funny name as well, because, you know, there weren't too many servers. There were probably like a dozen servers that you used. Um, and, um, uh, you know, computer, you know, pro developers and operations people being kind of like the, the needs and, uh, you know, kind of being like sci-fi geeks and so on. What they did was they kind of like named these servers after, uh, you know, Star Wars characters or uh, you know, Star, Star Trek characters and, or, or from the, you know, characters of the Lord of the Rings. But we kind of like moved away from that now. So with, um, with one of the big changes that has been happening, which is virtualization and, and deploying uh, our applications to virtual machines, um, the general thought has moved away from, hey, you know, we don't even need to know the name of the server that we're actually deploying to. So we talk about this concept of, uh, you know, treat servers as, uh, as cattle, not pets. So pets as being in, you know, it's something that you look after and you have a name and you kind of like associate with the pet and so on. Whereas cattle is, is, is you know, you, you kind of like don't name them, you know, uh, uh, you basically just know them as cattle, right? So they want to try and start treating uh, servers as cattle. And so uh, we, we kind of reproduce any um, server environment from scratch. And when we want to destroy it, we destroy it and we recreate this whole thing again. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no, uh, you know, we don't, don't have to worry about what is named and so on and so forth. Now, the, the, there are three big changes that have actually happened in terms of infrastructure, right? One is this, this concept of virtualization of VMs, where we start to, uh, you know, where we can actually create virtual machines and deploy software to it on, on demand. And uh, the second big one is moving to the cloud uh, and where we've, um, uh, you know, all these cloud providers uh, have, have come in and uh, they allow you to, uh, you know, they, they provide infrastructure as a service. So you can basically reposition and provision service, services on demand whenever you want. The third big change in infrastructure has been the emergence of containers. So containers sit on top of IaaS um, or, or sit on top, top of, um, of VMs and they can be quickly created and uh, you know blown away they can be quickly created they can be scaled and um, and all that kind of stuff now all of these infrastructure changes have created automation opportunities uh, for us and uh, you know i want to touch upon one uh, one thing which is the which is configuration drift one thing with infrastructure right is that you have different environments that you deploy to you deploy to dev test and, uh, and production and uh, uh, like i said earlier over a period of time uh, due to uh, varying degrees of patches and upgrades that are being done on these machines at different points in time they soon get out of sync and because they're out of sync you know what worked in one environment may no longer work on on other environment. this this is basically called uh, configuration drift the configuration of these servers have actually kind of like uh, uh, drifted away now uh, with infrastructure automation uh, tools you know tools such as puppet you it, it kind of like helps you address this configuration drift so just want to keep this in mind um, uh, you know as you go through the talk I did say earlier that one of the big changes that has actually affected um, CI, CD and automation in that space in general is the advent of the cloud. Um, now, uh, cloud providers uh, basically uh, release, um, you know, they, they have an API and uh, CLI or command line interfaces for every service that they actually provide and, uh, and every, you know, every way that you can actually operate on them. So if you want to kind of like do scaling or you want to provision something, you can actually do all of these things through the use of CLIs and APIs. And that has immensely helped in, um, in automation. Now, uh, with the cloud, of course, you know, you can provision uh, infrastructure on demand. And people actually talk about this concept. When I talk about cloud, right, I'm talking about public cloud, uh, but it can also include private cloud. Um, I know a lot of people basically say, you know, they've got their own data center and they refer to it as a, as a private cloud. 
Um, but if you cannot script things and you cannot provision things on your infrastructure um, on demand, um, yeah, that that don't, you know that's still just a data center. It's not a private cloud. Um, so it would be to classify as a private cloud. You should you know developers should be able to self provision a lot of these things, and they should be able to script the whole thing. Otherwise, it's just like a like a data center, right? Just that you can actually create VMs rather quickly, but nothing more than that. Now, cloud has several variants in our, you know, how you can actually deploy to them. One is, of course, uh, infrastructure as a service, right? Basically deploying infrastructure. Uh, it's very similar to how you do it. They used to do it in, in the physical environment. You can do lift and shift and move some of these services that are working on physical hardware onto the cloud, and they'll just work really well. But uh, a lot of cloud providers also provide what we call as platform as a service, right? So they have storage and databases and everything else, and they abstract away some of the things away from you, like you know the operating system, for example. You don't have to worry about what operating system it runs on. You don't have to worry about uh, uh, you know security. You don't have to worry about things like patching these things, environments, and so on, because that is taken care of by the cloud the, by the, the cloud providers. Serverless by extension is the ability to actually run uh, things like functions on them. So you kind of like write a single unit of function and you deploy it to you know, Azure or, or AWS. And um, you know, whenever you want to call this function, you just basically go and call this function. And if you want to have multiple people calling it and it needs to scale, uh, you know, the cloud provider takes care, of all the care, takes care of all the scaling and everything for you. And you effectively end up paying just for what you use. So it's a very attractive model for a lot of people to actually deploy applications in this. The third model, of course, is containers, like I said earlier, right? Um, one nice thing about something like uh, about containers is that uh, you know you could actually, you know, if you're using a Docker container, for instance, they are kind of like you know, transportable across multiple cloud providers as well. IaaS services and PaaS services and serverless. Uh, so let's, you know, a lot of these things have, um, uh, you know, are kind kind of tied down to the platform itself, and there's very little portability. Well, so you can port some of these things, but it's not a zero effort, right? There's a lot, there's a bit of effort that's needed to be done to actually kind of like move uh, some of these workloads from one cloud provider to another. Something to be to keep in mind. Of course, with um, now with uh, infrastructure automation tools, um, you know, uh, the, this is, the, you know, we've, we've spoken about uh, CI-CD tools, right? CI-CD tools kind of like help in, uh, uh, in creating these artifacts itself. How about actually deploying them? This is where infrastructure automation tools come, and play, come into play. So they help in provisioning infrastructure and deploying your applications primarily to the cloud. Uh, I say primarily to the cloud because some of them also deploy to uh, on-prem systems. Um, but I think the focus here is around deploying it to uh, your cloud provider. Now, uh, one of the things that's actually uh, come a long way in helping us move towards the, uh, helping us with the infrastructure automation tools is this concept of infrastructure as code. And so effectively what you do is you, um, you kind of like uh, represent all your infrastructure and configuration in code, and you also check that into your version control system. So when you want to create a brand new environment from scratch, all these tools do is they pick this whole environment up from source code from the from the version control system, and they're they're able to recreate entire uh, infrastructures and uh, you know application and everything else. Now, uh, ad hoc scripts can be written uh, to, to to kind of like deploy these these applications, you know, creating a virtual machine or um, uh, you know, creating a database and so on and so forth. Um, but the problem with ad hoc scripts is they kind of like soon become very unmanageable, um, particularly when you have a large amount of servers, you want to kind of like deploy it uh, to multiple regions and, um, and all that kind of like gets complex. Now, the other thing is that most of these ad hoc scripts are, um, uh, you know, kind of like executed in, in, in sequence, the kind of like in, imperative, uh, uh, code you kind of like you know, go one line at a time and uh, so um, you know if you already had like a database for instance you've got to have a lot of checks in place to say hey you know if the database actually exists you know don't create it if it you know, if, or if this change exists so you know you have to do in a lot of if else statements and you know cater for the exceptions and so on 
Uh, and also, um, what if something actually goes, goes wrong? You have these item potency issues. So um, rolling back some of those changes becomes extremely complex as your uh, scripts grow and there are a lot of uh, components that you have in your application that needs to be deployed. This is where some of these tools come into the rescue. Um, so you have, uh, first and foremost, I wanna talk about these configuration management tools. Now, uh, these tools are used to install and manage, manage software on existing servers. So if you already got these servers um, running in the cloud, uh, it's very easy to kind of like configure and deploy your applications to them. And they work, um, support distributed deployment. A lot of them actually um, allow you to uh, declaratively say what the end state of the application is. So rather than saying, you know, create a database, you can say, you know, the end state is that this database needs to exist and this is its configuration. Or, you know, I want this number of servers, this application deployed to this X number of servers. And so, uh, you know, these tools um, will automatically uh, do all of that uh, work for you. And of course, you know, it supports distributed end deployment. Um, so if you want to um, even deploy to, you know, not just multiple services, to deploy to different regions and so on, you know, it kind of like helps you do a lot of the stuff. Examples are things like Chef, Puppet, and Ansible, right? Server templating, you know, rather than just launch servers and configure them, server templating uh, creates an image of the server that you want to run on. Uh, so if you, you know, what you do is you create a snapshot or copies of the server, uh, and, uh, and then you kind of like deploy them to various, um, you know, wherever you want to run your application on. Images uh, can uh, either be virtual machines or they can be containers. Uh, examples of uh, server template, you know, Packer, Vagrant, and Docker are some of the examples in, in that sit in this space. Now, the next, uh, uh, so now one thing that I would want to mention is like, you know, you, you can actually use, uh, you're not restricted to using just one tool or the other. So you can use a, you know, combination of these tools. For example, uh, you know, you can create things using, um, you can create containers using Docker, right? And you can also uh, use some of these configuration management tools to, to roll them out. So you, you can use a combination of these tools. Now, uh, orchestration tools kind of like help in deploying, monitoring, and scaling some of these VMs and containers that you've created. So, uh, uh, you know, if you create a Docker or you create a, a VM, uh, you know, it help, allows you to, um, uh, to, to roll them out to, to these orchestration tools. Now, um, there is a point now, one of the things, right, is that as, you've, uh, as you demand high availability and so on and so forth, you want to make sure there are certain things that auto-scaling automatically happens and you want to make sure that these applications are monitored and uh, there's some kind of self-healing and so on and so forth if something actually goes wrong. Now, orchestration tools kind of like help with these things. And then there is a point where CI CD tools kind of like do their work and then pass it on to the platform for it to do these things. And this is where something like Kubernetes and Docker Swarm and you know, Amazon ECS or you know, Azure, uh, you know, AKS and all those kind of things uh, help. So provisioning tools are responsible for creating the service themselves. So, um, you know, uh, examples are things like Terraform and CloudFormation. What some of these tools, like, you know, something like Terraform does is they abstract away cloud sp provider specific API and so on. So uh, it allows you to, uh, you know, irrespective of what cloud environment you're deploying, whether you're deploying to Amazon or whether you're deploying to Azure, it allows you to, uh, it kind of like provides a layer of abstraction. And so when you write things in Terraform, it really doesn't matter which cloud platform you deploy to, it actually takes care of some of these underlying things for you. Now, of course, all of these things, you know, need automation as it, they, they work on the basis of automation itself. And um, a couple of other things that I want to talk about, right? One is this, um, this concept of chat ops, and we use this AGL as well. Now, uh, what is chat ops? I mean, it's basically a conversation driven operations that can be used even for something like CI CD. So the, uh, the conversation is triggered through a, a chat system like Slack or Teams. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, it's not restricted chat systems. You know, you can also do it through SMS or email, but primarily this is what people use. So you go into uh, Slack or Microsoft Teams and you basically type in uh, certain things and that effectively ends up triggering a build or 
you know, like a, a release and, and, and so on. Now, this is kind of like very, it's become very easy for service operations people to not jump into multiple tools to do things. You know, they can also, they all do this in the comfort of, uh, uh, you know, in their desktop, in their chat window, they go in and can actually provision a bunch of things within the chat ops. So this is, this is one of those things that, uh, uh, you know, the automation has actually helped achieve in this space. The last one that I want to talk about, right, that's had a lot of influence is, um, and I kind of like touched in various points during, during the talk itself, is this availability and reliability requirements. Apps now demand higher availability and more reliability from these applications. So, you know, when you talk about SLAs and so on, they won't have multiple nines in the SLAs. So there's literally, you know, any, any downtime of the application itself. So, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, applications shouldn't have a scheduled downtime. So, uh, you know, you kind of like use some of the deployment techniques that I spoke about earlier to deploy to production on the go all the time. And applications also need to have self-healing capabilities. So, uh, you know, if something goes wrong and they kind of like need to, to rebuild it from scratch or, you know, have uh, additional uh, servers to cater for more traffic and all those kind of things. You know, there are certain things that are built in, in to the that, that that the environment should actually provide to to help with these things now catering for a lot of these requirements is not possible without the help of automation so that's one of the the, the big takeaways uh, uh from this talk that i want you uh, to think about um now now these aren't the only things that uh, uh you know these are probably i suppose like the top 10 things right there are other things for that have uh, that have come up and one example that i can think of is the advent of microservices so we build a lot of applications as uh, our services as really small microservices. These microservices can actually be um, written in, you know, in, in any language of your choice and uh, deployed to the service. And when some, some of these things go wrong, they have a kind of like a limited blast radius. It doesn't affect all these other systems around them. Because they're actually small, you can actually deploy them um, frequently and uh, you know the lead time for that is um, is is low and so uh, you know some of these things have kind of like contributed to you know, to you know automation and CICD you know these are some of the things that have been either influenced or affected by these things now as we get to the to the end of the the, the talk like I want to kind of like um, talk about a couple of things one is some of the challenges that we still face um, there are two things I want to talk about primarily the change management process uh, is one big thing. Now, a lot of organizations have uh, what we call as a, a cap, a change, um, um, you know, like it's basically a change approval board that approves changes um, so that if you want to roll something into production, they give you a tick mark and until that, that you know, cap gate is passed, it cannot roll into production. As we release more frequently, multiple times, multiple teams releasing multiple times during the day, uh, the change control board could end up becoming a bottleneck. So we want to kind of, I think one of the things that's actually happening is people are now starting to use more lightweight process in managing some of these things. So the, the one, uh, one thing is, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, we want to have proof of compliance, right? We want to make sure that the right things have actually been done so that when it goes into production, it doesn't fall apart and cause things like brand damage and, or financial damage and things like that. So uh, as part of the, 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 the CICD pipeline, you know, when someone checks in code, you know, there's a whole bunch of testing, automatic testing that actually takes place. In addition to that, peer review of some of those codes before it actually hits production is a very important thing. So you'll find that people are slowly moving across through uh, uh, to this lightweight process, but it's a big change in terms of governance. For a lot of organizations, um, it is a very difficult choice to actually move, move away from a, uh, from a cap um, kind of a model. I think, uh, uh, um, you, know, you know, I think eventually, you know, it will happen. It's, it's kind of like a mindset change as well, right? The second big challenge is in, in the form of uh, in cloud itself. Now, you have, of course, multiple cloud providers, you know, the, the top three being, uh, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, and, and Google. And they all have different ways in which they actually run their stuff. You know, even when you talk about infrastructure as a service, uh, these things aren't transportable across from one cloud to another, number one. Number two is that when they release platforms as a service, they all have similar things. 
and yet they're different. So, you know, they all provide, let's say, compute and storage and data and you know, all those kind of things, uh, way of actually addressing these services, but they're all different and unique. And the number of changes that these people are actually making makes it really hard for, um, uh, you know, some of these, these tools providers to actually keep up when you're provisioning things and so on. I mean, to their credit, a lot of them are actually quite good, um, but uh, sometimes there could be a potential lag between these two, um, you know, when, when, a, when a tool or a service goes GA and, uh, you know, the changes are subsequently made in the tool to actually um, cater for that. Now, what happens is uh, when uh, people think that they can actually run the same workload across multiple clouds and so on, it becomes a bit of a big, uh, big challenge. Uh, you know, it's still, uh, I suppose, like it's very, still very hard for us to actually create a single, you know, it's very easy to say, hey, you know, this workload runs on Amazon, this workload that runs on Google, and this one runs on Microsoft, and to actually kind of like set it all up that way. But if I say I want to run the same workload running on Amazon and Azure, and I want it to be load balanced and things like that, those kind of things are still very hard to do. Not impossible, but still hard to do. And one of the challenges that um, that are there, and sometimes uh, um, these challenges are more commercial um, in nature as well. So with that, right, I want to kind of like uh, talk about uh, the state of DevOps report. Now, this is a report that Google publishes that comes out once uh, once a year. They've been doing it for the last six years, I think. Uh, the last one came out in uh, 2019, and uh, I think the next one is due to come out in November or, or you know October, November this year. And uh, this is a really, so if there is one uh, document or, you know, further, for further reading that uh, I would like you to do, uh, if you haven't already read, uh, look up the state of DevOps report. It's a really comprehensive report on what people are doing. And, uh, um, and it talks about, uh, um, you know, the, the cultural changes that we need to do and uh, uh, some of the, uh, you know, technical capabilities that we need to change in order to have to, to do DevOps in general, but again, to improve uh, the CI, CD uh, pipeline and automation and everything else in general. With that, I've kind of like come to the end of the talk. Um, you know, my, uh, my email ID is mail at mahe.sh. So if you want to reach out to me with further questions, you know, feel free to do so through that email. Um, that's my Twitter handle over there, Mahesh Kishan. If you want to tweet about something, you know, asking me something on Twitter, you know, feel free to do that. And um, and that's all I had. I think I want to open up the session for questions at this point. Yes, thank you so much, Mahesh. Um, I'll leave the video on you since you're more interesting to look at than I am in this context. Um, but I think you can hear me. Um, so I will just, I hope we could pause for everybody to applaud their own little corner of the planet. Um, so we have some questions in the session Q&A sure. um, sort of panel in Hoover. Um, you can both ask a question and you can upvote questions. So I encourage you to go do that. We have uh, just about 10 minutes for questions before we want to prep for the next session. So um, I will just start from there. So at the top right now, um, the question that we have that has the most votes right now says, asks how good or adequate do you think the current uh, industry used tools for version control are, especially for conf conflict detection or merging? Um, and do you think that trunk-based development helps or hinders merging or conflict resolution? So it's kind of a two-parter. Cool, all right. all right. I see the question there. So I just opened the lab just so that I can actually read. Ah, perfect. So yeah, you don't even need me. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think the, you know, uh, version control tools, you know, so, you know we use uh, GitHub for a lot of our um, version control systems. And, uh, you know, these tools are actually quite good these days. I mean, uh, from the days that, you know, I actually don't actively cut code anymore, so I'll put it out there. But I've actually seen that when, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, all the developers in, in my team, when they actually use it, they all, uh, they're quite happy with the way, um, it, it, the code, you know, all the merging and, and all those kind of things work in, uh, in GitHub. Uh, when, we, when you do things like, um, you know, when you do a pull request, for instance, how you do peer reviews of this code and you kind of like start to accept those things. Um, that it's phenomenal from the way that actually works now. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's come a long way from, uh, from the days where, uh, you know, it's very difficult to do these things. Um, trunk based development help in uh, the, the second part of the question was, does trunk based uh, development help or hinder emerging conflict resolution? Um, you know, one, one thing about trunk based development is, you know, 
here's the thing is like for a lot of mature teams and you have senior developers and so on, they kind of like prefer trunk based development. And, um, you know, I don't think it's a, it hinders merging and conflict resolution. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this, it does help a lot in, uh, um, you know, research has actually found that the lead time where, you know, the time that you actually made the change and how it actually goes to production, I think I did mention this in the talk, um, is a lot better when you use um, uh, trunk based development. I can also read the next question on this I can, one. I can do it for you. Okay, I don't have to both ask and answer your questions. Um, so the next question we have is, do teams use test first development in your experience? So this person's found it hard to teach the, the approach to students and hasn't found many industry teams actually using it. Uh, part one. Part two, would better test generation tools help? Yeah, cool. So uh, this, is, this is actually a challenge, right? So um, particularly in, in the industry, I mean, like, uh, when you start a project from scratch and when the team is actually quite mature and so on, you know, we, uh, TDD is, is the way to go. But uh, typically in a lot of organizations, there's a lot of legacy code out there and uh, uh, people have kind of like moved midway from uh, what they're doing. Um, you know, previously, you know, very in the way of working, right? It kind of like moved away from kind of like a pseudo uh, agile uh, methodology to kind of a bit more agile and so on. And uh, you know they, they didn't have a lot of unit tests to start with in their existing code, and so a lot of them actually struggle with uh, with the test first development approach itself. Is test first approach, um, and, and you know this is this is one of the things that I did mention, right? This is not an absolute necessity for um, CI CD, but it definitely helps with the mindset that everything needs to be tested, and uh, you know the code coverage uh, in terms of what of tests and everything is, needs to be extremely high you know, it kind of like sets that very, uh, the thought in your mind really early and it really helps in, uh, in writing good quality code, I feel. I think the second part of the question is, would better uh, test generation tools help? Um, I suppose it does. I mean, there are a lot of tools that people do use, um, uh, but are also, you know, all the teams that I've actually worked in, uh, they don't use the test generation tools. You know, they kind of like start to code these things from, uh, uh, you know, manually code them. So uh, I, I, think, uh, I think your mileage may vary is, is what I'll actually say. I think um, based on my own experience, you know, a lot of people don't use it, and, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean the entire uh, you know, spectrum of people who use it. Great, thank you. Um, I'll keep going since sure. these questions are great. Um, so we have a question now saying that orchestration and provisioning tools seem to be a great area for ASE type research or outcomes. Um, what are the current main drawbacks in these tools that you think we should be looking to address as a research community? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, right? I mean, like, um, so one, one thing that we actually find uh, uh, is, um, is it takes a while for uh, some of these tools to catch up. Um, so for example, uh, you know, cloud providers, they it's kind of like the number of services that they actually generate or, you know, release number of features or upgrades that they actually do is phenomenal. And sometimes it's very difficult to actually keep up with uh, with a lot of these things. Uh, that's 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 the first thing. That's one of the the, the you know I suppose like a, some of, one of the drawbacks, right? And I also feel that these tools are very mature in um, when they're handling things like uh, uh, infrastructure and containers and so on. But sometimes when they are working with platform as a service, I think there's a little bit of a lag in in how they how they work. All right. So. Good. I actually like Aldeida's question better than mine, so I'll skip to hers. <laughs> what is the role of architecture in CI/CD, and how do, you, do your teams document it? I'm gonna turn my video on because at least you have one person whose face you can see. Sure. So, what's the role of architecture in CI/CD, and how do your teams uh, document it? Uh, I suppose um, you know uh, it's interesting because I think. Uh, when you look at DevOps team as a whole, um, and which is, the, which is the team that kind of like most of the time is responsible for CI CD, um, you know, there's not a lot of architecture involvement in it. Not that I mean, sorry, I should say there's not of architects who actually get involved in it. Um, so, um, so, so, you know, like it's generally taken care of. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there's no architecture influence on it and architects may sit in and, you know, talk to the teams and so on. But I've generally not seen a lot of um, of architects in it, right? 
uh, they could be saying, you know, one of the key requirements that could actually be come out is, you know, frequent releases and so on and so forth. And that kind of like changes the way that we do, do things. Um, that's one thing. The second thing is um, not necessarily CI, CD, but uh, in particularly in terms of, uh, you know, reliability and high availability and so on and so forth. Architects do have a, a, a say in a lot of those things. So that's the only other area that I can actually think of where architects do get involved in this. So um, how do the te teams document it? Um, well, I, I would say that one of the, the nice things about um, infrastructure or configuration as code is it's kind of like self-documenting. So you kind of like check in the, the code into, uh, into the version control system. And that's one way of, uh, of looking at what's being done and so on. So I'll ask one more and it's, it's a little self-indulgent because it's mine, but the answer may be short, which is good because we're right at the end. Um, so you started, you sort of framed your talk as, a, as about kind of the development and progression of um, sort of process and deployment improvement and automation since kind of a more waterfall oriented model in the 90s. Uh, do you think anything has been lost? Was there anything good about it? I think, um, you know, I, you know, if you were working, I suppose, like, a, uh, I mean, like, you know, this is, this, it's, it's kind of like, a, the answer is it depends, I would say, right? I mean, maybe you've spoken like a true consultant, but, um, uh, you, you know, if we, if we are having a requirements, like, a, if all the requirements were known upfront, and you knew exactly what you wanted to build, uh, particularly, you know, we talk about things like, you know, the, the example that uh, gets thrown around is like, you know, NASA and, you know, launching a space shuttle or something like that, right? And so you, you don't do a lot of these things through, uh, you know, kind of like agile methodologies and so on. You kind of like have all the specs written and given to you beforehand and kind of like build out of it. And, uh, but I find that a lot of things that we work in, a lot of things that I work in, at least I should say, right, are, you know, things like uh, applications that are running on the, you know, the web and so on and so forth or the enterprise and uh, the requirements aren't um, as solid as the, what they used to be. In fact, users kind of like make up their mind or change their mind on the go. So we find that a lot of this, the you know, general methodology actually works really well. Um, so I'm not sure whether we've actually lost something, but um, uh, I think releasing to production frequently is actually a good thing in my opinion. So there is actually one more question that I like, and then I think, I mean, there's one more question, period, and also I like it, and so I think I'll ask it, and then I will yeah. uh, send everyone on their way to the next session so that we're not running late, because we're not late yet. Um, and that is a, sort of a joint question again. How can AI help CICD, and what do you think is next in the evolution of CICD, like over the next 10 years? Okay. Perhaps a bit leading. Okay, so this is an interesting question, right? So I think, um, um, there are a number of things that can actually happen. I mean, one thing is uh, we're talking about development itself, and uh, if we talk about whether we, whether when you know uh, you can actually use AI tools to help you write code, uh, as an example, right? And uh, it may not be it may not be writing all the code for you, but you know, as soon as you start uh, typing something in, it kind of like starts to figure out, hey, this is what you want, you know, and kind of like go search in a database of already previously existing code, and then bring some of those things up for you. And uh, I also think, you know, potentially, you know, even for something like CI, CD, and when you start to cut some of the code and so on, there could be a, this, this, all these, these resources at your disposal that, uh, um, you know, you could actually use things like machine learning and so on to actually figure out what is it that you want to do with it and uh, automatically kind of like help the, um, help the developers and, you know, the, the ops people kind of like, you know, create all of these things, right? Uh, that's, that's what I'd say. Uh, I suppose like, um, you know, uh, I, I haven't thought about it enough to say, you know, what is it that's going to happen in the next 10 years or so, but yeah. it's definitely something uh, food for thought on, you know, where the industry is going to, uh, to head towards. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's a good, a good question to end on, I think. So thank you so much again. Um, wish we, we should have like a fake applause like Zanka. <laughs> It's a little anticlimactic, just me, but uh, we really appreciate it. And I, I know that everyone got a lot out of your talk. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. Everyone else, um, thank you for listening. Now, uh, our technical sessions are starting. So I encourage you to go to them. And I look forward to seeing you all over the course of the week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mahesh. Have a great week. <laughs>